Right. So I'm Lars Olofsson. I'm the <coughs> team lead for the networking team. I'm based in Reykjavik. And with me is Jeremy Martin, the multiplayer service guy, based here in Boston. So I'm going to go through what we are doing with the multiplayer <coughs> feature, like uh, what we mean by democratization, uh, basically what we've done, what we plan to do, just a general overview. And then Jeremy will take over and do kind of deep dive into the service part of the, this feature. So like the overall idea is to have a, a feature anybody can use to make a simple turn-based, like low requirement game up to a fast paced, like uh, FPS, highly visceral games. Uh, it should work with <clears throat> any size, one-on-one -on -one co-op up to massive scale. Like this is the overall vision. It's not like a one byte feature. Like we have to take it in chunks. So like we have uh, split it into three phases. Like this was mentioned at the uh, roadmap talk today, but I'll just go through it again. Like uh, our first phase is sort of like a, like a foundation layer, just to get the, the API, the feature itself, like how you use it uh, ready. And we shipped this already in Unity 5.1 and improvements in 5.2. So this is like a typical multiplayer uh, library with uh, support for hosted servers, like client servers in the same process, uh, server authoritative design. And we have the services you need to get up your connectivity, get infrastructure working. Uh, we rolled out with limited platforms initially, but we'll be adding them as we go. I think uh, we have the basic platforms, iOS, Android, uh, the desktops, Mac, OS X, Linux. Um, we're adding WebGL, Windows 10, Universal Platform. These, these are coming. They sort of work already, but they're not shipped yet. Um, in our next phase, which we are implementing now, which is uh, rolling out in 5.3, 5.4, and in the near future, we have a, like a dedicated server DLL, which is just like a uh, only the UNET, uh, uh, multiplayer protocol in a single DLL, so without the whole engine around it. And then also like a dedicated server uh, or simulation server, which is like a custom Unity player designed to be uh, like a server hosting for like massive scale of clients. Like we're, we start rolling this out, this won't come out as like a single feature, but probably be like a, uh, in chunks, like initially aiming at five, four. So I think we'll mention that a bit later more. Uh, phase three is like a bit farther on. We'll see how the phase two goes. That's more like MMO territory, trying to have uh, support for many servers, like handling many instances, handling persistence, like databases. Like that's more in the future, but like this whole picture uh, paints the it just paints the picture I mentioned in the beginning, like to support all your needs in a, as easy as we can make it. So, the multiplayer pain, it's like it's like making a multiplayer game has a <clears throat> quite a bit of pain involved. So, there's like a costly thing to do. Like sometimes you need. A uh, knowledgeable person to implement multiplayer, like someone who knows like client servers, how to split like uh, inputs and uh, world simulation, how to synchronize state. Like doing all this is is uh, non-trivial. Um, there's a lot of protocols. There's a lot of technology you need to know, serialization, uh, like finding players can be difficult. Uh, connecting players can be difficult with uh, firewalls and NAT issues. Uh, infrastructure around this can be like uh, complicated. It's not like normal development work. Um, yep. So pain relief, like how 
well, we, we try to fix these things to make them uh, just uh, utilities or tools available to you, so you don't need to do all this yourself. So you don't need to know like the details of how all this works. You just use it. Like we provide it, you, you use it. Um, we have uh, today. We have a, a component in Unity. Like it's a, sort of like a high-level uh, API. So it's very easy to attach things together. We have a drag, drag, and drop components basically to set up connectivity, to set up uh, position synchronization, <coughs> to set up uh, state synchronization. It's all as easy as possible. But then below this, like this, all this is using a transport API, like a network transport class, which is basically like a thin layer on top of sockets. So. You can use that then if you want to go deeper, if you need something custom. And we are working on like uh, open sourcing the, the higher level components so you can see how we do it. You can customize it, do it your own way if you want to. And then we have a matchmaker and the relay server for the discovery and connectivity problems. Um, and we'll, <coughs> Jeremy will talk a bit more about those things. Um, so this is a bit more just about what I was talking about. Like the the transport layer has uh, channels, multiple channels. You can have multiple levels of service, quality of service. You can have unreliable, reliable, fragmented. Uh, you can you can set up multiple connections with the transport layer. You can have uh, clients connect to multiple servers, dedicated servers for chat, for 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 the game data, for whatever you need. You can do basically anything you want. Um, then the higher level components build like a more simple to use uh, interface. And it's designed to be a, like a server authoritative with some shortcuts to make easy, easy to do client prediction and that kind of thing. We have a, like a client authoritative checkbox for like, your player object so you can just make it control himself, so you don't need to do like a server authoritative way first. Like it's very simple to do, <coughs> so we try to make it simple to do these things. And like in 5.2, we're shipping uh, miscellaneous client authoritative objects. So you can allow a client to own like his set of objects. Like the server always vets like what is okay before he like spawns everything on the other clients. So we design this API to be like uh, secure to make sense in that regard, but still be as simple to use as possible. And uh, the matchmaker, it's uh, <coughs> like room-based uh, lists. Um, the relay server just relays traffic. Uh, I think you will go into that also. I won't go too deep into that. And yeah, when, when we're integrating into the whole service uh, idea now with the service window, and uh, easy to set up. Um, I think you cover all that, so I should just I hand it over to you. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, so for the service infrastructure, um, this exceedingly simple dialogue kind of shows you the steps you end up going through between um, setting up your game with the web configuration, having your game talk to Matchmaker, and then being handed off to Relay Service to uh, facilitate network play uh, over the internet. No talk through each of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, for an overview, the services that we host uh, in the cloud, as uh, Lars mentioned, Amazon EC2, uh, we handle deployment, configuration, scalability on the back end. Um, we have three data centers available currently uh, in America, Europe, and Asia, and we have another data center planned. Uh, currently, the services are in a free preview. So anyone can just sign up. You get uh, 100 concurrent users uh, globally. And what that means is you can have 100 players worldwide playing your game for free on our service backend over the internet. <clears throat> for the web configuration service, uh, yeah, there's a single sign-on that's been added in Unity 5.2, which makes uh, setting up a multiplayer project very, very easy. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Uh, the web configuration service, the big thing that's required right now when you log in is to set the number of uh, players, uh, the max number of players per room. And that's a hard limit that's enforced by the service. 
that's, of course, separate from the global CCU of 100. So let's say, for instance, um, out of that 100, you want to have, I don't know, a typical room size might be 4 to 16 people, say 4. Um, you'd set 4 in the web configuration service, and then uh, Matchmaker knows when it's uh, replying to requests, you know, if matches are full, if there's room left, if it should, you know, bother trying to fill up rooms and what the priority is related to all that. And that's all based on the configuration there. And in the future, we're going to be adding more configuration through this web service. So it's, it's kind of the one-stop shop to, uh, to administer the back end. <clears throat> in Unity 5.2, um, we, we changed and simplified how you actually uh, set up the service in the editor. So there's now a uh, cloud configuration panel. <clears throat> this is the same cloud configuration panel you're flying for all Unity services. <clears throat> where we're listed there um, all the way at the bottom. Um, so you, you click on that little cloud button at the top left. It's a service panel. It reflects the information that the uh, editor then goes to fetch on the back end. It automatically downloads. It automatically downloads your project ID and gets everything together underneath the hood uh, to be able to talk to Matchmaker. This is a screenshot of the web, con service pa uh, the web configuration service panel that I was just talking about. Um, again, you can kind of see it's, it's very basic. <clears throat> it shows you know, who you are, who you're logged in as, what organization this project belongs to. Uh, the uh, UPID is what we're calling it, uh, which is the unique identifier for the project that helps identify this game um, is, you know, this game is your game in Matchmaker, and Matchmaker will only match games um, within a single UPID to each other. <clears throat> uh, and likewise, it shows you the max uh, global CCU allowed, the total currently used right now, and the max players per room. And yeah, uh, setting it up really couldn't be uh, easier at this point. You just have to log in, as I mentioned, through the editor. Uh, configure the room size that is required. Matchmaker will not allow any matches uh, to proceed until that last page I showed you uh, shows that it understands what the, um, the max per room size is. Uh, so we know how you want to tailor your game. Um, and yeah, refresh configuration in the, uh, in the editor so it pulls everything down. <clears throat> so moving on from the configuration, we have the Matchmaker uh, service which is the first real runtime component. Uh, this is uh, the uh, example UIs that we have for interacting with Matchmaker. Uh, so you can see in this particular, in the UI at least at this level, you would hit Enable Matchmaker and then on the right side uh, you have all the options, the high level options to interact with Matchmaker, which I'll get into a little bit more in a second. Matchmaker's role is um, to facilitate allowing uh, really anonymous players, we don't have friends lists, we don't have deep social integration or social graph or anything like that. We don't track player statistics or history. It's anonymous matchmaking and allows players to find other games on the internet based on criteria that you set up as a developer. Uh, right now, we have a series of functions um, for match-based matchmaking. Uh, of course, you have to create match, list, join. You can drop an individual player, destroy a match, and set match attributes. Uh, and yes, it's usable through several mechanisms um, in, the, in the Unity client, and I'll get into that right now. We have the matchmaker component, uh, which you can set up in the, in the editor. Um, you see how the configuration there on the left-hand side is kind of reflected on the right-hand side, like the match host ends up being reflected as this is the URL that you're going to connect to for the matchmaker. Uh, mm.unit.unity3d.com is our, um, our base URL, and we have several others um, that uh, on our, are available on a per data center basis. <clears throat> uh, quick overview on how to use the API. Drive a script from network match, and uh, you call create match, create a match, list match to list matches, and then once you're satisfied with the match that you pull out of the list match results, uh, you can then use information contained in the list match response to join a match. All functions are, are asynchronous, um, happening on coroutines that uh, get status callbacks after they're uh, after they're done, whether they succeed or fail, they get a boolean indicating success, and they get a string indicating ex um, extended information if it failed. So an example of doing a create match, and I mean, you know, this is a one-line thing. That's all you really need to do to talk to Matchmaker and have a have a client set up a room. Uh, in this particular example, the create match uh, is named new room, and that number four, the uh, the 
the second variable in the function signature is uh, the client preference for how many players it wants to allow in the match it's creating. Um, so uh, previously when I mentioned that as the developer you can set a hard limit on the max number of players that your game will support per match, uh, whenever you create a match you can also have another number that can be up to that amount. So if you want to have a game that could support eight players in some modes, you would set eight in the web configuration service backend. And then when you actually go to create a match, you could, you know, if you have a special game mode that only allows four players, this is where you'd specify that. Um, <clears throat> the uh, last part of that is the on match create, which is just the function callback, the status handler I was mentioning. It ends up getting, in this particular case, it'll get the uh, extended information, uh, the success or false Boolean on whether or not it succeeded, and if it succeeded, it'll have information like your network ID to be able to go forward and then talk to Relay and whatnot, which I'll get into in a little bit. <clears throat> Likewise, this is an example of a list match request. Uh, list match returns results in a page style. So the, the first part of the function, the first thing you pass to it is what page you want, and the second part of the function is uh, the number of results you want per page. So if you want a relatively stable order of list matches, you'd just pass in the same size page, in this case 20, um, and you'd go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You'd be able to look at the results that way. Uh, this is kind of a generic way that you could hook up to you know, some kind of UI uh, to be able to show available games, or you could just query this information um, and automatically pick a game based on the, uh, the response that's handed to the on match list in this particular callback. <clears throat> join match uh, works very similarly to create match. In this case, since you're not creating a new match, you're joining an existing match, uh, you end up pulling out the network ID that was contained in the list match response for the particular match that you want to join. And yeah, the callback handler gets invoked when um, that join match succeeds or fails. <clears throat> Our matchmaker backend is a C -sharp web service. It is, uh, we require HTTPS encryption. Um, luckily, that just happens for free underneath the hood. It's based on JSON REST interface, service stack, IIS, very common web technologies uh, for persistence on the back end to keep things straight like database or to keep things straight like match state and clients connected and things like that. Um, we, we persist things into MSSQL uh, as necessary. Uh, likewise, we, have, uh, we use memcache to try and speed up um, really frequently use data operations or things that uh, don't change very often, very static data. It's very, very good to throw into memcache. We make heavy use of that. Uh, we have zero MQ and protocol buffers for server-to-server -server communication. Uh, right now, server-to-server -server communication is just matchmaker and relay server. Um, so as part of a create match request or a join match request, <clears throat> while the web request is still open, matchmaker will go and set up all the state on the back end, the database state, and it'll also uh, select a uh, relay server uh, based on least load to hand off and then uh, give you the information that you need in order to connect to that relay server uh, once the request is handed back to you. Uh, we have extensive performance data monitoring uh, so we can scale the backend service, perfmon integration, event log integration, site monitoring, uh, automated configuration management so we can just throw up more servers. And, um, it's all uh, hosted in Amazon EC2. <clears throat> Uh, at a high level, this is kind of what the lifetime of the matchmaker looks like. You'll put together a JSON REST request, which is what happens when any of the functions I just showed you um, is called. That happens underneath the hood. Uh, actually uses the www object in Unity. That ends up calling out to the, to the URL that's specified. Uh, if you just use the basic URL that was shown a little while ago, you end up being um, uh, sent to the most local data center to where you are in the world. So if you're in America, you'll end up in America. If you're in some part of Europe, you'll end up in our Europe data center. <clears throat> the data center itself has a HTTP load balancer, which then uh, hands that off to an appropriate uh, matchmaker instance, which services the request, like I mentioned, does all the back end setup that's required, and then uh, ends up re uh, replying with a JSON REST response. <clears throat> The matchmaker is really just the service at runtime to set up, manage, and configure games um, that are going to be happening on the internet. Uh, one thing to kind of keep uh, note of is uh, some of these operations are sort of trusted operations. You, you wouldn't want someone, for instance, 
uh, griefing other players by you know, calling drop player requests or things like that. So whenever <clears throat> you first uh, connect with an identity, it's not a thick login. We don't require players or anyone to log in. Whenever you connect with either a create match or a join match request, you end up getting a uh, authorization token, an access token. That token um, will uh, identify the device for the lifetime of its connection to Matchmaker and Relay. And it's a one-time use thing. We do support uh, rejoining. So if you, you know, if you leave the match and then the match is still going on, you come back and you choose to reuse the access token on the join match request, uh, you'll rejoin as if you were the same client. Uh, all the same data will happen on the back end. Uh, list match is completely anonymous. It doesn't handle an access token. It's purely there to enumerate matches uh, and provide the information so that you can then call the join match request. Uh, drop match is allowed if you are either the creator of the match, which is considered an administrator, or if you're the client that's being dropped. So if you're leaving, um, <clears throat> this doesn't happen in the uh, currently released version of Unity, uh, but probably for 5.3, we're getting a change in that's going to automatically call the uh, um, uh, drop client, actually, not destroy match. Um, it's going to call a drop client for everyone that leaves. Uh, so you are instantly cleaned up in the back end database. And if you're the last one out of the match, the match ends up being cleaned up because of that. Um, destroy match and set match attributes always require admin privileges. Only the host can set that up. <clears throat> oh, um, I should also mention set match attributes is a, is a new feature that's going to be coming out. Um, it's on the servers already. Uh, the actual JSON contract will be in a future version of Unity um, relatively shortly, probably 5.3. Um, that is going to be the access to be able to configure a match that's currently running. Um, the first version of it is going to allow changing some attributes on the match, like whether or not the match is uh, publicly listed. So let's say you have a use case where you want to create a match with your game. And before it's full, you know, you're, you're done, you want to continue, you don't want anyone else to join your game, uh, you'd have the host then send up a set match attribute request and just say, don't, don't include this match anymore in uh, future list match requests for other players. <clears throat> so once you uh, create or join a match, as I mentioned, uh, Matchmaker ends up returning the information needed to connect to our relay service, which is a, a relatively different animal. Its entire purpose in life is to relay packets from one client in a network to another client in a network. You can kind of think of it like a VPN um, endpoint uh, that's at a well-known IP address uh, that we control on the internet in Amazon. We have a lot of relay services, and I'll get into a little bit about how relay service scales and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it, it solves issues that you would normally have um, trying to overcome uh, NAT in particular with IPv4. Um, so you have a consistent external IP address that you'd connect to, which is ours, and that allows you to peer host a server, uh, which is how Unity multiplayer works. Someone in the match is a server, everyone else is a client. Um, and you don't have to worry about router configuration or UPnP or NAT punch through or anything like that. This will work if you have a UDP route to really Amazon, to the internet. Uh, relay service is packet header based. So all the information needed to um, set up a match is included in the initial contract between Matchmaker and Relay. And then uh, the information, a subset of that information to identify the sender and the receiver of each packet, um, which is really the same uh, Unity multiplayer protocol that we use for direct connection. Um, Every packet contains a header that just has the information to authorize that, uh, that packet to move to the intended recipient um, within the same match. There are definitely protections and security allowances in the system. <clears throat> Contrasting the earlier slide about Matchmaker, uh, Relay Service is a, a optimized C++ x64 standalone service that's heavily multi-threaded based on uh, Windows IOCP reactors. It's IPv4, IPv6 capable. Um, we use a couple open source um, frameworks. We use uh, LibUV for eventing, uh, Intel TBB for data structures and atomics, very useful. And uh, this also interacts directly with uh, Microsoft SQL to handle uh, persistent information on the back end. Uh, it has to receive 0MQ uh, and protocol-based communications from the C-sharp web layer, so 
that's listed too, and of course perfmon event log. Uh, importantly, relay service has been optimized so that it is uh, allocation and memcopy free once it hits a steady state. It heavily reuses all of its, um, all of its socket objects and thread-related objects. <clears throat> Uh, for an individual packet coming into Relay uh, for connection over the UDP channel, uh, really a Unity multiplayer packet, uh, you'll have it come in, the IOCP thread dispatch will happen, it'll end up being given to one of many threads that's been instantiated on Relay. Uh, that'll read the header info, it'll look up the data that's required uh, in atomic-friendly data structures in order to avoid uh, synchronization points. Um, and thread contention, and then it'll turn that out and send it back off um, using an uh, overlap socket operation. Relay server <clears throat> is communally hosted, so we don't end up spinning an individual relay server instance for an individual match. We, we actually pool matches together onto our, our fleet of relay servers in our various data centers. Uh, each relay server can have up to really 65,000 uh, 535 players, and because we have a requirement of each match has a minimum match size of two to prevent people from soaking up CCUs that, you know, don't need to be soaked up, uh, that leaves 32,000 and change matches. <clears throat> um, and yeah, each data center can have any number of relay servers. Uh, we can spin up new ones as, as we see fit based on performance information and site health. And, uh, Relay server has performance uh, monitoring built in so that a uh, matchmaker can make intelligent decisions on where to create new matches. <clears throat> uh, these are the URLs for the data centers that I mentioned a little earlier. If you use the main one, uh, you end up being given to the most local site. But there are use cases where you'd want to do uh, a particular URL, like the US, the EU, the Singapore URL. Uh, let's say you have a game where you have people that will play together very often. Maybe they'll get to know each other or something like that. Uh, and, you know, it's entirely possible if someone flies from Singapore to the United States. Um, if you were using the base matchmaker URL, suddenly they're going to be in a totally new data center, which will be more optimized geographically for latency, but then they'd never see the people they play with in Singapore. So some considerations to make. <clears throat> Uh, Relay server ha does have some safety limits since it's communally hosted. We impose a 4K per second per player limit. Um, and very importantly, that includes all network headers. So uh, the IP and um, UDP headers do take up bandwidth, so we have to calculate that in addition to the data payload um, and the headers involved with um, the Unity multiplayer protocol. To try and be as fair as we can, that's calculated over the lifetime of the connection. So when you first connect, uh, each, each uh, player in a match, each client in a match, is given for free two minutes worth of bandwidth. And that's so we won't you know, instantly disconnect you if you have a very spiky uh, connection handshake that requires serializing a lot of data up front, which is a very typical use case. Um, and then in addition to that uh, two minute grace window, you end up going forward and you're credited 4K per second after that. So in order to actually exceed the bandwidth limit, you need to be egregiously over the 4K per second, probably for a little while. Um, so the, uh, there's also a 30 second timeout. You can't stay connected indefinitely to relay server if you're not sending packets. We end up uh, cleaning you up so that we can um, give the seat out to, you know, another, to another client that ends up requesting something on Matchmaker. And yeah, if you're disconnected for any reason, uh, we do support rejoining, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you just end up calling the join match request on the matchmaker. It'll give you the information that's required to rejoin, reconnect to the match, and it's the identical flow to joining a new match. Future work. We're going to be adding more monitoring and notification for bandwidth usage. Right now, that's, that's really a weak spot for us. You don't really have any um, good feedback on if you're approaching the, the 4K per limit ceiling. Um, and we need to address that. Uh, we have a couple ideas on how we're going to how we're going to bring that together, but nothing we can really announce today. But we, we are aware of it, and we, we will fix it. Um, uh, likewise, we want to provide more monitoring uh, for you to be able to see the current state, usage, and health of your game, uh, likely through our service backend. But again, we're in, kind of in planning stages to try and get this all together, um, and better match search filtering. Uh, 
currently, the servers include the notion of uh, match attributes. And when that's implemented on the client, you're going to be able to uh, create matches that have, um, I think it's like up to 10 right now, uh, key value pairs of strings and ints. Um, and that's up to you to define what all those will mean. And then when you do list match requests, uh, you can filter against those network attributes to find exactly the kind of match you want. <clears throat> the uh, server library is something that we're actively working on right now. Um, should come out in a, soon in a future version of Unity. Um, hopefully 5.3, but that's, that's not a definite yet. It still needs to go through testing. Um, it's intended for non-Unity applications to interface with uh, a Unity client or server uh, using the Unity multiplayer network protocol. So if you, have, if you have a heavy server use case or something that would just be inappropriate right now for maybe a, a headless Unity client to run, uh, you can create your own application or you can marry our protocol up to your application, provided it talks uh, C Sharp in some way, um, or you can load a C Sharp DLL. And you'll be able to then, uh, over the network, use all the features I've described here, the Unity multiplayer protocol, the relay service, matchmaker, everything. For dedicated uh, server hosting, we want to allow developers to be able to uh, create and upload special builds uh, directly from the editor um, that will then host uh, in, in the cloud and you know, take care of scaling and all the other issues we've, we've fixed with our own servers. And this would actually be your game code that's running in our environment um, where we take care of a lot of the, the behind the scenes stuff. Um, yeah, so that's, that's something we're, we're also really just, just starting to dig into now. So it'll probably be a little while before this comes out, but it's definitely it's on our to-do list. Uh, the reason we want to support dedicated servers is right now, with Unity multiplayer uh, being a, a peer server hosting um, system, uh, you can have reliability or possibly performance issues sometimes for some game types. Uh, and, and we're very aware that you know, while peer hosting is very convenient and, and definitely good for the majority of multiplayer use cases, some of them really would be better served by a dedicated server environment. Host migration. The uh, reliability brings me to this. So when you are hosting in a peer environment, um, you know, it's quite possible, like let's say you're on iOS or Android or something like that, and the, <clears throat> the uh, host of the match ends up getting a phone call. They tab out, the application you know, stops responding, effectively disconnects. Right now, everyone would be forced to disconnect. The match would time out. You know, everyone would be a little bit grumpy. The play session would be over. Uh, but we have this new feature, which allows host migration if something like that does happen. And I will tab out and show you how to set that up. <clears throat> it's uh, really, really, really easy. Um, and I mean that because this is a Space Shooter with three A's. It's, a, uh, it's an internal demo that we use um, for, for testing some of our network things. Uh, but very importantly, it's just a normal project um, uh, networked with our, our higher level stuff with sync vars and replicated with RPCs and you know, the, the same tools that, that you'd use. Um, and it, uh, it, it right now will completely fall prey to everything I just mentioned with, uh, with a host going away. But if I take this project, go to the uh, network manager, which is over here, and then I add a, uh, a new manager, uh, which is going to be coming out in um, a future version of Unity, hopefully 5.3, yeah. Uh, this network migration manager will take care of all the logic required to migrate hosts when something does happen. That's it. No coding. Didn't have to drop to C Sharp. It just interacts with the existing code you would have set up uh, with SyncVars to, to make sure that state is um, handed off appropriately and a new host is chosen. So I have a build. And that, that's, you know, normally go to file build and all that stuff, but live demo, I wanted to have the build ready. <clears throat> all right, so I'll start up the first game here. I'll land host. 
see, we've got our little ship here. We've got bullets. The sound effects are really wonderful, but we don't have them right now. Um, this guy will join that match. <clears throat> you see, I'm controlling, I'm controlling the screen on the right. So he's a client in the match talking to the first one that joined the server. I'll add another guy as a client on that match. So there you go, three happy little ships firing happy little bullets. But it's not so happy when the server goes away. And without the host migration, uh, the network migration manager component, this would be the end of the match. It would, it would time out, you'd be done, you'd have to you know, find someone new to play with. But there's this new dialogue, which is a little hard to see with the scaling on the laptop, unfortunately. But the network migration manager added a, uh, a boilerplate UI and callbacks that allow you to pick a new host. So I'm going to tell it to pick a new host. Both guys would click on this. And this one says start as host. So now he's back in the game, right where he was. And this guy reconnects to the same host. So now the, this server on the right has become the new server. Uh, all state match, um, or all match state is maintained uh, as it was previously. And this guy is the odd man out who started it. But it's even possible, you know, he's done with his phone call, he's going to come back. How about we reconnect? There you go. He's back. He's not, he's not the host anymore. Lost his hosting privileges. That's what you get for leaving. But uh, there you go. That's, that's network migration. Yeah, that's going to be coming out in 5.3. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's see. There are some caveats. Of course, uh, you do have to be using um, sync vars and sync lists, the higher level of our, of our API, because that's how we end up migrating the state and uh, repairing the damage that would otherwise be done behind the scenes when the host does go away. Um, uh, you also have to be aware that all data from the server that's relevant for the match needs to be, um, uh, needs to be synchronized this way. So if you have a server use case where it's inappropriate to send some information, like trusted information, to the client, uh, network migration would, would not be for you, um, because that state would be lost the instant that the uh, original host goes away. Um, and yeah, showed all this required, the network migration manager. All right, um, as we're wrapping up, I wanted to throw up this slide. Is there a bunch of URLs you can go to to find out more about uh, Unity Multiplayer? Um, some of the ones towards the top are a little bit outdated, but they still contain some really good nuggets, particularly like how we planned this feature and started going forward, and that's still very much how we operate. You know, we, we want your feedback. We want, to, we want to understand what you need in a multiplayer game, because we, we want to know what to work on next. It's very important. So you can kind of see how we've steered the project and ended up releasing what we released on, what we're working on now. And that goes all the way down to the um, multiplayer forums. Uh, all the developers on the multiplayer team are on there regularly. We're always checking if people have issues or if we can help out in any way. So I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, wanted to throw this up, daily prize drawings. Um, don't forget the, uh, the feedback survey. And yeah, contact us directly. Um, any questions? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm working on a project that will involve voice chat. Do you have any thoughts on that, and particularly regarding the, uh, the bandwidth limit? Yeah, the bandwidth limit would be very hostile to voice chat right now, at least going over the game channel. Uh, right now, the relay server is very first version, uh, very intended for game traffic. And that 4K per second is the reasonable limit um, that we arrived based on previous experience and some research and testing we did uh, just for game traffic. It's not intended for voice traffic. Um, but you know, if people have a strong desire for, for a voice channel or a way to accomplish that, we're happy to work on it. But you don't have any plans right now? No, we're not working on that right now. OK. Hey, Jeremy. Hi, Dave. Uh, hi. Uh, this is Dave Woodruff, uh, an old coworker from, from Turbine. Yeah, that's right. And uh, matchmaking is uh, very much on my mind right now. Oh, cool. Uh, I'm curious, like you said that you, you could match based on a set of name value pairs. Uh, uh, in the future, we'll be able to. The, the server infrastructure has that. 
um, one, of the, one of the really nice advantages of uh, being able to work on the servers is we're not tied to Unity feature releases. So the servers end up uh, having things regressed and tested frequently before they're in the, the actual Unity client. So the Unity client is released on 5.2 right now. And some of these features uh, for the client contract are going to be in 5.3, but the servers kind of marching a little bit ahead of that. They're ready today is really the. OK. Uh, the thing I was wondering about is, like, I've, uh, what we've been seeing, like, with our matchmaking that we're working with is that invariably the game designers want something that's not easily expressed <clears> just <throat> by, like, equality or, like, range checks. Yes. So, like, they'll want something like, oh, we want matches where these people, like, don't have a particular key or like yep. we want to match based on a range and then match <clears throat> inside another range. Yep. And all of this kind of like informs what data structures you really want to have on the back end. Yes. Uh, I, so it's, I imagine that would be hard for you. If it we, is. I mean, in order to accomplish that and catch every use case, we'd probably have to open ourselves up to something like an SQL style query language. And you know, that, that can definitely go awry if we're afraid, if we're afraid of people misusing it. But at the same time, what, what the servers will have for a first pass implementation on that um, is uh, it's a little bit more sophisticated than range logic. You're going to be able to do you're going to be able to do math operations against the the integer side of the value pair. Likewise, you'll have access to a restricted uh, wildcard operator um, on the on the string side. So you're hopefully going to be able to cobble together most things. But I'm I'm sure people could come up with you know the unicorn that is not going to you know fit in the box. So. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Hey, um, I thought the server migration looked really cool. Thank you. Uh, I had one question slash suggestion about it, and that would be, is there any sort of automated migration? Because if you yeah, are I'm expecting, yeah, OK, keep going. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, great, great question. Um, I probably should have gotten to that a little bit more. But uh, that boilerplate UI was, was really just for demo purposes and to make it easy for you to get up and running um, so you really don't have to touch the code. But we do allow you to override that, and you'll have um, function calls that will allow you to put your game logic there. And you can pick the new host. Uh, you can you know, do whatever is appropriate for your game, query the player, however that works. So, awesome. Thank yep. you. Yep. I have two quick questions. Uh, for the authoritative games, um, I mean, you, you could do that now, if I understand correctly, uh, using command and client RPCs if yep. it's, uh, you mm -hmm. know, turn-based uh, strategy <clears throat> game or something. Second question is, do we still need a uh, policy server for WebGL networking? You want to field this? So, yeah, what's the first part of the question? You, you can do server authoritative today. The, the high-level API is all designed around that, and it just depends on... Like if one of the clients is <clears> the <throat> server, it's not maybe it's not super secure because the client well, I'm, can do. I'm thinking more like a, a headless server. Somewhere. Yes, like exactly with a headless server. Today you could run a <clears throat> Unity player. It could be uh, act as a dedicated server, and it all our API is designed to be server authoritative. So you can build that today. It all works. It's just like uh, the server would be like a normal Unity player, so it's not super efficient to run as a server. <clears throat> so the second part uh, with... Do we still need policy servers for WebGL networking? So if there, let's say, WebGL is, is connecting to this yeah, but server. Yes, so I don't think you need that for the WebSocket stuff we've been doing. No, not that I'm there, aware of. There was, you didn't need that, no. But Great. like, thank it, you. Yes. <laughs> Um, is there any sort of timeline for when the 100 CCU limit's going to change or whether people will be able to host their own yeah. matchmaker and relay servers? I, I wish there was. I mean, that's the question on everyone's mind when it comes to our services. Right now, we're trying to figure out the right way to, to, to do that. You know, we don't want to make a mistake when it comes to charging for this and how we're going to really offset the cost associated with uh, cloud hosting is, is the big concern. Um, so we're having those discussions today. You know, it's not that we're hiding anything or there's anything nefarious. It's we're trying to figure out the right the right thing to do, the best thing to do for all all Unity developers, and we don't have anything to announce right now. Yeah. So the big question I think is whether companies can host their own versions of Matchmaker and Relay in the future, possibly. Yeah. Right now we haven't committed to that, but everything's possible. I know that we have other providers of these services already. They're represented in the sh showroom, right? Yep. How do you compare to them, or why re reinvent this when they already have services provided to us? 
Well, there's so there's different providers today, and I guess the probably I <coughs> guess the main strength they have is that they have been there longer, they're more polished, more stable. But we'll <coughs> get there. Um, I guess I could just mention that the relay server is similar to the Photon Cloud stuff, <coughs> like other stuff like Bolt. I think Forge, like uh, Ulink, they have more like a dedicated server type, like uh, not cloud relaying. And we can do that as well. It's like we are, like the, the future feature uh, Jeremy mentioned with uh, dedicated uh, server DLLs, the simulation server, we're getting more into that territory to support that better. So, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, because we can, great. What? Well, the answer is because we can. Yes. I mean. I, uh, I had a question about when the socket connection actually gets created. Uh, is it when you call create match or join <coughs> match or? Uh, so <clears throat> the, the entire matchmaker flow happens uh, pre, uh, pre match. So the, since the matchmaker is uh, HTTPS, TCP based, it's just talking to the web service at that point. And then after you get the callbacks with the information needed to go into the match, mm -hmm. uh, that's the point where, um, uh, for instance, our network manager, it calls into the Unity multiplayer code and then establishes the connection to relay service, which, which is the Unity network protocol. So that's the point where it starts. Okay. And um, say, uh, say we're running on a tablet or a, a mm -hmm. mobile device, and you know, say someone presses the home button. Yep. Uh, one of the common problems I've had, like creating multiplayer games, is like you lose the socket connection. Yes. Um, is I mean, I'm sure that's the same issue with you guys. Yeah, that's uh, stuff like that is exactly why we were driven to work on host migration so early. Um, that's the use case that should take care of that, and that's also one of the reasons we have the requirement of. Uh, you have to really share all your information. You can't hold anything secret on the server because when that server goes away, particularly when you're talking about a mobile device, you may not have time to do a parting shot of like some serialization packet of all the hidden stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so if everything is shared properly using our, our high-level protocol, um, you can just switch over to another client at that point. And it basically looks like uh, since the, the host, the server, is also a client, it should just look like that client dropped and the match continues. Like okay, so happened. there's a timeout period where the other people get a... Uh, yeah, it knows relatively quickly. I mean, you saw it in the live demo. Uh, that realized relatively instantly that it was done and, and did the, the switch over. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, just more general question. Sure. Um, so uh, compared to like WWW, do you guys, are you expecting to like expose like general uh, functionality like that and maybe replace <coughs> WWW? Are you like... The, um, you mean for the matchmaker interface? No, no, just in general as networking, um, like making web requests, um, things like that, uh, to support new features, mm -hmm. like HTTP 2.0, like things like that, um, or just kind of more future roadmap for you guys. You so it's fun. not, we're not doing anything specifically for like the dub, dub, dub class, but yeah. there's another team working on like the web request class, which is like a replacement for that. <coughs> uh, doing that properly. Uh, it's experimental in 5.2, but that's like a separate area. We're not, we are not working on that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I guess that's it. Got about a couple minutes left if anyone has a question. Otherwise, uh, we're at the experts table. Yeah. Any... Yeah, we'll be at the experts table until I think six today and, you know, all day tomorrow when it's open. So please drop by, yep. say hi, keep us company. Um, it's been a pleasure seeing you all. Thank you. Yep, thank you.